is not on. Nice to see you guys. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here at Foothill Church. And uh, let's just go ahead and bow our heads in a word of prayer as we get started uh, before we look at this passage. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the nature and the character of your word. I pray that as we open it and study it this morning, that you would help us to see your truth, uh, to apply it to our lives, and, and ultimately be transformed by it. Uh, we love you, God. We thank you for uh, this church body. I pray that you would soften our hearts uh, to your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, uh, one of my favorite movies, um, I won't say of all time, but oh, I really enjoy the movie called Signs. Uh, maybe some of you guys have seen it. It's an M. Night uh, movie. This is kind of uh, pre-crazy Mel Gibson time. Um, and the reason why I liked it so much was because it, so much of the movie's setting and the characters and everything, it kind of sets you up for what this movie was about. And so everything that, that the movie was talking about, it kind of got you into this mindset that said, this is where we're headed with this, with this movie. Um, everything from the setting and the context of it. And so this is what I'm in store for, only to realize, if you've seen the movie, towards the end you realize it's not just another you know, sci-fi alien movie, right? Uh, there's more to it, and it's kind of this plot twist that you don't really see till the end how everything kind of comes together. And so, so I have to be honest with you all this morning. This passage in Mark uh, chapter 11, it kind of threw me through a loop this week. Um, this is one of these passages where I, I started studying early on and started writing out my sermon and talking through, uh, you know, what is, where are we headed with this? And only to figure out that, man, I got half of this thing done. I'm studying some more commentaries, reading about it. I'm completely off here. And so I had to kind of chuck my sermon and start all over again. Because maybe if you look at this passage, and like I did, you realize, and maybe you think initially, that this is about the wrath and the anger of Jesus. And so that's what I thought anyway. So I have my four points, and I'm looking at the anger of God and how it relates to this story in Mark from the Old Testament. And I'm kind of looking through this from that lens. And then by what I believe to be God's grace, I kind of stop and I realize there's much more to this story. And so while we see that Jesus does in fact get angry here, uh, he, he gets upset in the temple. Um, he's actually furious. While we see that that is definitely one of the themes, it's not the point of the passage. And so we need to look at it from the right perspective. And so this morning, with the time we have together, I want to show you what, what I believe to be the point of this passage. And, and that's simply this. I believe that Jesus will do whatever it takes. He will go to great lengths to draw you and I, his disciples, to himself. He'll do whatever it takes to bring people closer to him, to, to fix people's eyes on him and him alone. And so he'll use anger as a vehicle to get to that destination. He'll use it as an example. And so was Jesus upset? Was Jesus angry in the temple? Yes, he was. Was it righteous anger? Absolutely, it was righteous anger. But he has more up his sleeve than simply just flexing some muscle and getting really ticked off and throwing some tables around. He wants to teach us a lesson. And so if you've been with us in the book of Mark for any period of time, you know that Mark uh, does this thing sometimes where he'll, he'll take two lessons, two stories, and he'll kind of make a sandwich out of it. And so he, he starts with uh, kind of the preview of the lesson where initially we're looking at the fig tree and how that applies and, and where, that, where that's going. And so then he takes to the kind of the meat of the sandwich and talks about the, the interaction at the temple. And then he wraps it up back at the fig tree. And so this morning what I want to do is kind of follow suit and I want to look at um, how, how Jesus kind of takes his disciples through this journey of the fig tree to the temple, back to the fig tree. And my hope, my prayer this morning is that as we walk away from this service, that we would have a better understanding of what, first of all, Jesus is calling us to be his disciples. He's calling us to himself, and, and because hopefully you will see that it is all about him. It's all about Jesus, okay? So let's start with the preview of the lesson. Let's go ahead and read again Mark 11, verse 12. Mark 11, verse 12, on the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So 
let's talk about fig trees for a minute. Um, in Jewish history, the fig tree was this example that prophets would use quite often. And so this was something the disciples might have heard before. Uh, this is an example that isn't new to them. And so the fig tree, it kind of was, was this, uh, this object of symbolism with the Jewish people that anytime God would, would show his righteous anger or judgment uh, for people and their habitual sin, he would talk about the burning and the cutting and the pruning of this fig tree. And so this wasn't new, but, but Jesus takes it a step further and he, he walks up to an actual fig tree, and his disciples kind of hear this interaction happening. And, and so what he's experiencing is, um, if you were to walk up to a fig tree and see that the fig tree is covered in leaves, right? It's a healthy tree. Um, it has leaves all over it. Whether or not the fig tree is in season for fruit or not, uh, you would have at least had all these little buds called pagum. And pagum were these little buds that should have been all over a leafy fig tree. And so it doesn't matter whether or not the, the figs were in season or not. Uh, you would have had these things called pagum. And so if anyone were to come up to uh, a tree like this, they could at least get a little bit of nutrient and a little bit of a, just, just a little snack. And it may not taste it very good, but at the very least you would have got this, this pagum. Um, some were hard, some were small, and, and some were kind of on their way to being full-grown figs. And so Jesus had this expectation, walking up to this fig tree that was fully leafed, that, hey, at the very least, I can grab just a small bud, a small pagum on my way to Jerusalem. But the closer he gets, the closer Jesus gets to the tree, the more he, he realizes there's no fruit on here at all. There's nothing for him to eat, not even a pagum for him to have on, on the road. And so uh, Jesus curses the fig tree, and it says the disciples hear him. Now, why does he curse the fig tree? Um, it, it's important to remember, he's not necessarily doing this out of anger. Um, he's not cursing at the fig tree. He's not like throwing F-bombs at the fig tree and just freaking out, right? That's not what's happening here. He curses the fig tree, and he does so simply because the fig tree is deceptive. It deceived him. It kind of duped him. And so uh, he, he thought that there would be figs on it. Uh, he saw the leaves. And so he curses the fig tree. And he basically says, look, you look good from a distance. But when I get close, I realize there's no fruit. And, and because of that, what good are you? Uh, what do you bring here? There's nothing productive uh, for you to even be around. So he, he curses the fig tree. And as you see, God will, Jesus will use uh, his, the nature of, he, he has God, it has um, authority over creation. And so this fig tree withers and dies later in the story. And so it's a startling rebuke. It's a great reminder for you and I today. Because, man, like the fig tree, I, I think sometimes we as Christians can try and do a great job of looking the part, uh, of looking like we have it all together internally, when in reality, we're spiritually dead inside. We don't have anything going on. And we can fool ourselves, we can fool other people, but as we see, we can't fool Jesus. And, and so, not only is this just a great example, a, a little lesson, a little story, Jesus is being gracious to his disciples. Let me tell you what I mean. He, he's giving the disciples a preview of what they're about to see in the temple. And it's so gracious. It's so kind of him because to this point, the disciples have never seen Jesus angry the way he's about to get angry in the temple. They have no context for it. And so if they were to see that, they might have just this meltdown because it's like, Jesus, why are you doing this? And so out of graciousness, before Jesus demonstrates his anger in real life for the same issue in the temple, he demonstrates this through the lesson of the fig tree. Um, the disciples wouldn't have thought Jesus would have gotten angry at the temple. I mean, maybe at the palace, maybe uh, to overthrow uh, Herod or Caesar and, and just try to get his throne, throne back, but not at the temple. It's not something that they were prepared for. And even though they've seen him get angry before, right? We've seen this through Mark. Let's review this real quickly. Mark 1, Jesus gets angry when people are harassed by demons, which is a good thing, okay? Uh, Jesus gets angry about that, and it says he rebukes the demon, which is a very strong word. In Mark chapter 3, we see that Jesus gets angry when people are more concerned about looking religious 
as opposed to helping people and their true needs. He gets upset by it. And we see that in the story of the man with the withered hand who, who the Pharisees don't want, to, don't want him to heal the hand because it's a Sabbath. In, in Mark chapter 8, we see that Jesus gets upset when Peter th- tries to thwart Jesus' mission. And, and so he says, Peter, get behind me. He calls him Satan, right? Really intense. He gets angry. And then uh, just about a month ago, we, we studied about how Jesus got indignant at the disciples when they're playing security uh, against these children that want to see Jesus. And so the idea of Jesus getting angry isn't necessarily a new concept, but an outward expression of his anger is a new thing. And again, because Jesus is gracious, because he's, he loves his disciples, he wants to walk them through this process, he gives them the story uh, at the fig tree. And, and remember, this is a timing thing too. This is a timing thing because we're coming up on Passover week in the middle of this week here and everybody's headed to the most holy city, the most holy temple in the entire world. And so everybody's headed towards the temple and Jesus is saying, look, if there's gonna be spiritual fruit anywhere, it's gonna be here. So let's read about it in Mark 11, verse 15. Let's look at verse 15 together. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. So here's the scene that we're seeing. Jesus walks up towards this temple. Um, it's, It's a huge temple. It's a temple that Herod built. And Herod built this temple, and it's enormous. It's enormous in size. You can kind of see kind of an artist's rendering of it. But if you've ever read in the Old Testament before about Solomon's temple and the glory that was Solomon's temple, Herod's temple was easily ten times the size of Solomon's temple. It's just a huge building. And it was probably built as kind of a pride thing in, in the glory of Herod a little bit. But regardless, this temple was just humongous. Um, comparing it to Solomon's temple, it'd be like your, your local mom and pop, you know, hardware store to Home Depot. It's just, it's much, much larger. And so Herod had just built this temple. Jesus is walking up the hill towards the temple, and he's expecting to see all kinds of spiritual fruit at this temple. He's expecting people to be praying, to be worshiping, to be in in communion with one another, getting ready to to be before God. And and so if it was going to be any place, it would be this place. And so Jesus walks up to what's called the court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles is this large part you see at the beginning, and then it kind of gets smaller and smaller. The buildings get smaller. The court of the Gentiles is the place where everyone was welcome. It was kind of the main entryway to the main temple. And so uh, biblical scholars say that it's about 300 yards by 500 yards in size. And this is the size of of five football fields, right? It's just a huge area, and it would dwarf the other areas of the temple. And so the further you got into the temple, the more, more, uh, what's what's it called, Uh, privileged you were, right? So you start in the court of the Gentiles. You get closer in. It's the court of women. Um, in, in, in further is the court of Israel, where only good, law-abiding, circumcised Jewish men were allowed. And then at the middle of the temple, and maybe you guys know about this, it's the most sacred, the most holy place on earth is the Holy of Holies. This is the place where they believe, that Jews believe, not metaphorically, but actually the presence of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. And so because of that, only one guy, the high priest, was allowed there. In fact, uh, in the Old Testament, they talked about how they would tie a bell and a rope to his, his ankle just in case if this high priest was overwhelmed by the greatness of God and died because of it, they would at least be able to, to pull him out with a rope. I mean, this place was intense. And so we could talk about the temple for a long time, uh, but just to sum it up, the temple was designed, the whole point of the temple was so people could be close to God. It was kind of the place between heaven and earth where people could be close to God. And so even though it would be amazing to look at, right, if we were standing in front of this huge campus of the temple building, uh, it would be covered in precious stones and capped in gold, and it would just be this enormous campus. The point of the temple 
was to invite all kinds of people from all kinds of places uh, to be with God, to worship him. And that was everyone. Um, that was Jews, Gentiles, men, women. It was all inclusive. Everybody was invited to the, gent- to the, to the temple. And, and so because of that, Jesus expected to see uh, worship happening. He expected to see people praying. And again, like, there was spiritual fruit, people from all kinds of uh, different backgrounds, all different kinds of financial backgrounds and all walks of life coming together, literally being drawn by God. They didn't come on their own. They were being drawn by God to the temple to see him and to worship him. Um, in fact, Jesus quotes this. This was his expectation. Look at Mark 11, uh, verse 17. He was teaching them and said to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? What he's doing here is he's actually quoting the prophet Isaiah. And so if you want to write this down, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but Isaiah 56, verses 6 through 8, um, this is what the prophet Isaiah says about it. And again, this has to do with foreigners, people who aren't a part of, of the Jewish heritage. Isaiah 56, verse 6, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord and minister to him to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. Again, so we're talking about people who aren't a part of the club. Right, people who are not Jewish, Gentiles like us, who would come and come to be drawn to God to worship him. And, and so this was always part of God's plan. This was always a part of God's plan, that, and Jesus was expecting this. This was his reasonable expectation, that he would see people from all over the place coming and worshiping. But instead, as we know, he doesn't find that. Uh, instead of opening the door and seeing a church service happening, right, he sees a swap meet. And, and there's things going on all over the place, business transactions and animals and, and all kinds of stuff's going on. And, and he sees it immediately that people are being distracted from worshiping God. Uh, instead of the temple being this place that would draw people together and to point back to, to God, it was a place of distraction because all these business dealings were happening. All these people, especially religious leaders, were exploiting people and, and robbing them, basically, as we'll see in just a minute. And this is what throws Jesus into a righteous rage. Let's finish the, uh, verse 17 on this. He says, my house should be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Pretty strong language. And here's what he means by that. Remember, this is Passover week. This is the biggest holiday on the Jewish calendar. And so people are coming from everywhere to worship at temple. This is kind of like the Super Bowl, right? I mean, just people are everywhere. And there's, it'd be packed and so because of that, they would bring their sacrifice, the sacrificial animals along with them, a lot of them, to atone for their sin to God. Um, but here's the thing. As a result of all that traveling and walking with a family, maybe you have uh, people who, who have older folks in your family or kids in your family, and you have to bring this whole clan along, it would have been very hard logistically for you to bring your animal. And so a lot of people were just planning on purchasing their animal once they got to the temple. Uh, and it's understandable because maybe you didn't have an animal or maybe you just saved up all year to buy this one lamb or goat or whatever you could afford. And so because people didn't have the ability to, to bring their animal, they would, they would expect to buy it there. Uh, they would start at the base of that mountain you saw in the picture. Uh, they would start at the base and they would start with these ritual cleansings basically showing God, God, I, I want to be forgiven, and it's only through you that I can be forgiven. And they would put their robe, the white robes on, and they would literally ascend up the mountain singing songs from the Psalms, and uh, they would, on their way there, they'd just be worshiping God. Uh, again, planning on buying an animal once they got to the temple. So here's where it gets kind of messy. Just like today, 
businesses were out trying to make a buck, right? There would be businesses all along this road of vendors that were selling supplies to these travelers. Remember, they've been traveling for, for weeks or days, and, and they might need supplies. And so part of that also was you could buy your sacrificial animal here. You know, that's no problem. Go ahead and do that. And uh, because of that, it was obvious very quickly that they were ripping people off. I mean, they were just charging way more than what a goat or a lamb should have cost. And here's what gets kind of even crazier. Uh, first of all, you had to pay a temple tax to actually just get in the door. It was kind of like a, a cover charge, right? Just, just to get through the door, um, you had to pay this tax, but to do so, you had to switch out your currency first. Because, like I said, people were walking from all kinds of regions. They have different coins, and so they had to pay their, uh, pay their temple tax with temple money. And so, again, as kind of part of the, uh, the deal, they were getting ripped off in this huge exchange cost that was happening. And again, it's, it's just obvious. And here's what's even nastier about it. The, the high priest, the guy, kind of the lead pastor of the whole temple, he was getting a cut from every transaction that was happening. So in, in, when they were exchanging the costs for the, uh, for the money, when they were charging people just to get in through the doors, the high priest had kind of you know, hired all these businesses and booths to, to put out, and he was getting a cut from every transaction. And so this would kind of be like if you showed up at Foothill Church today and just to get through the door, you had to pay a, a cost, a cover charge to get in, right? But before you did that, like I said, you had to change your money out for Foothill Church money, right? So you got your Foothill Church money, <laughs> kind of like that, right? I, I'm not sure if Pastor Chris knows I did that, but, um, but it, it's, it's kind of like going to Chuck E. Cheese or something, Right? It's just this, this arbitrary, like, oh, yeah, this is real money, I promise. It's no good anywhere else other than the temple. And, and so you get through the doors, you, you, you exchange your money out, and, and it's like, hey, you want, you want a Bible? Oh, we got Bibles for you. They're $300. Oh, we, we buy them, you know, in surplus, but we sell them to you for, for a high profit on our end. Uh, you want a cup of coffee? That's no, we got coffee. It's $27 a cup. It's Jesus coffee, okay? It's, it's, <laughs> it's special coffee. And you can't bring your own coffee and your own... These are the kind of rules that they would have experienced. And it, it would just have been obvious. And not only that, in this example, Pastor Chris would have just received a cut of every single one of those transactions. Man, can you see why Jesus is upset? He walks into this place of worship. And, and this is what's happening. And it's obvious. Poor people... Many of them who have traveled by foot for days, for weeks, are showing up, and this is how they're treated. And this just makes Jesus furious. And we've all experienced this kind of thing before. I mean, we've all been to the ball game or the movies, right? And you pay your $20 to get into the movie theater, and then your kids want popcorn, and so you're going to pay like $11 for popcorn or something, and you're just thinking to yourself, why am I paying 400% inflation on this popcorn. It just doesn't make sense, right? And it's frustrating, but you have to do it because your kids want popcorn or, or whatever, and this is why a lot of you guys sneak food into the theater. Um, but, but just ima you can imagine it, but just multiply that, that scenario by 100. Again, this is Passover week. This is the most holy holiday on the Jewish calendar in the most holy city in the entire world. And so people are, are there and they have to pay these costs. They have to pay these charges. There's no choice in the matter. And so Jesus gets crazy upset. And it's understandably so. And so he, he flips these tables that the currency exchanges are, are working at. He throws the money to the ground. And again, these, these tables aren't these uh, plastic and aluminum leg tables that we're used to. Uh, these are big wooden tables. He's just chucking them. Uh, some of the other gospels talk about how Jesus has this whip, and he's wielding the whip, and he's, he's chasing people out the doors. Uh, he's visibly upset. What Jesus is also doing is he's disrupting their entire economic model. If you think about it, people came that day, vendors came, business people came, because they come every year to do the same thing. They came there to make a high profit. 
And so you got all these people who, who are there, and, and they see these, these poor people walking the temple as easy marks. And so Jesus disrupts their entire business for that day. No money changed hand that day, and people are ticked off because of it. We'll, we'll see you later, but people are, are anticipating a high profit, and Jesus is hurting their income. Let's look at Mark uh, 11, verse 18. This is their response. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when the evening came, they went out of the city. It, it says that these religious leaders are trying and plotting to kill him, when, which we know that they will succeed in doing so in about four or five days. They're upset. Hey, you don't mess with the temple, right? You can do whatever you want to out in the hills and, and do your thing with your disciples running around like crazy people, but you come to the temple, you better have respect for, for, for this institution. And, and they're ticked off. And, and so there, there's, this is where it gets interesting because Jesus spends his time at the temple. He's teaching at the temple. They eventually leave that night, and, and they find themselves kind of back at this fig tree the next day. And so they're back at this fig tree, and this is kind of where it gets interesting. This is where you see that the, the story arc where Jesus is headed into his last week of ministry. He's headed towards the cross, and we see that Jesus isn't just upset in this passage because of a deceptive fruit tree. We see that Jesus isn't just upset because people are being taken advantage of at the temple. He's trying to teach us a lesson. He's trying to teach us something through this whole process. So let's read this together in Mark 11, verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. So here's the lesson to be learned here. Here's what he's driving at. Um, he says, Peter, have faith in God. And, and I, I can just imagine, I'm sure the disciples are just like, oh my gosh, thank you. I was wondering about that. That's so deep, right? Like, you have something for me to write that down with? And this is just amazing truth. And, and I think if, if Jesus was here today, he, he would say it a little differently. He, he would say, no, you don't understand. You don't get it. Have faith in me. And, and this is kind of what he's He's driving at this entire passage. Let's backtrack just for a minute. Where does most of this story happen? It happens in the temple, right? It happens in the temple. Jesus gets angry. He preaches. He, he exercises all of his authority at the temple. And so some of you may be wondering, well, why don't we go to the temple today? Right? I mean, Jesus went to the temple for thousands of years. Good Jews went to the temple. Why don't we go to the temple today? And so the reason... Uh, two reasons, really. Number one, we, we don't go to the temple anymore because there is no temple. Um, in, in 70 AD, uh, Herod's temple was destroyed. And so if you go to Jerusalem today, it'll just be a rub, like a pile of rubble. It won't be very much there. And, and secondly, we don't go to the temple for the same reason that I'm not going back to college. Let me explain what I mean by that. I, I graduated from college 10 years ago, and I actually had this dream uh, last week, this is a true story, last week I had this dream that I got a call from my college, I went to school at Azusa Pacific, so I got a call from APU at, at the registrar's office, and they said, hey, look, Stephen, there's a problem with your transcript. You didn't actually graduate. You still have, you know, X amount of credits to still finish. And maybe you guys have had dreams like this before where you're just like, you're just dreaming heavy, right? You're just in it, you're sleeping hard, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is like real. Like, I... I have to go back to school. And so in my dream, I literally had to quit my job here at Foothill. I had to take my kids and my dogs and my wife, pack up all our stuff, and go live in this dorm room at Smith Hall, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and I'm, I'm older than all the students, and I'm like, this is super awkward. I, I quit my job because I have to do this, and uh, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. What, why is this happening to me? And so uh, I wake up from this dream, and I kind of have one of those inception moments, right? It's like, is this real? Is this, is this happening right now or, or not? And, and I realize, no, I, I graduated college. I, I, grad, I graduated college. Praise God, I, I did it. <laughs> My graduation requirements are fulfilled. It's, it's all good. 
Now, some of you might be thinking, what does this have to do with, with this passage? Here's the deal. We don't go to the temple anymore for the same reason I'm not going back to college in that the requirements of the law have now already been fulfilled. Uh, you see, just like my graduation requirements, it's not that they were unimportant. They are important. It's just that they're already fulfilled. And so because I've graduated college, I don't have to live like a college student, right? I don't have to live that way and live in this small, like, 10-foot by 10-foot room and, like, eat at the crappy calf and, and live as a college kid anymore. I don't have to live that way. And in the same way, the Bible is filled with requirements, with laws. If you've read through the Old Testament, you see that there's tons and tons of laws. And again, it's not that they're unimportant. It's just they've been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They've already been taken care of. And so we don't need to live a life any longer that qualifies us because Jesus' life qualified us. You get that? I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing what, what, what that means for us. And so we can be free to live from the law and just free to live uh, with the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And so here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and round up a bunch of priests and, you know, slaughter a goat uh, in order to be close to God. And the reason is because Jesus is greater. He's greater. And so as we move forward to this passage, as we kind of wrap up the, the, the meat of this passage here, Jesus wraps up this lesson on the fig tree and this incident in the temple, and we're going to experience this shift that I was talking about at the beginning. So let's read verse 22. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. And he says, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. This is what he's saying. He's saying, guys, don't be afraid. Have faith in me. Uh, he, he's saying, I, I know I just freaked you out at the temple. That was weird, I admit, yesterday. I, I've never done that before. But have faith in me. He's saying when you pray, pray in confidence because I hear you, because God the Father hears you. When you have to forgive someone, just do it. You don't have to go to the temple and ask for a priest to mediate a forgiveness. Just forgive the guy. You see, back to what happened at the temple, with every table that Jesus flips over, with every pile of money and coin that he throws to the ground, Jesus is making this monumental statement He's saying, look, we're going to shift from this old temple culture, and we're going to now shift it onto me. It's all about Jesus. That's kind of the point here. There's a massive change coming. Uh, James Edward, he's a commentator on the book of, book of Mark. He says this, Although verses 15 through 19 are commonly known as the cleansing of the temple, maybe you guys even have that in your Bibles as the header, Jesus' action does not have the character of a cleansing, that is, the removing of impurities and restoration to a rightful function. What Jesus does in the temple goes beyond a purging or corrective act. It attacks the very commerce upon which the temple cult depended, laying an ax at the root of the temple as an institution. So if we understand what that means, that means that this was not just a day of spring cleaning. This wasn't Jesus walking into the temple and saying, oh, this is all out of whack over here, and we need to put this back where it goes and clean this up, and man, I can't believe you guys don't know how to run temple right. This isn't, this isn't a day of spring cleaning. It's more than that. When Jesus flipped these tables over and chased everybody out, he's making this huge statement, basically saying, look, you guys got two weeks. Clear out your desks. You're getting the pink slip, basically. And he's saying, look, we're done with this temple uh, culture. And he's upset. He's angry, right? There should have been fruit on the fig tree. In the same way, there should have been spiritual fruit of the temple. I don't, I don't know why there isn't, but there, there should have been. And so he's upset by it. But at the same time, at the same time, and probably more importantly, Jesus is teaching us. He's telling us that, look, I'm going to be beaten and tortured 
and eventually murdered on a cross in just five days. But because of what Jesus does on the cross, it means that you and I today now have direct access to the Father. It's a totally different mindset. It's a massive change. So what's changed? Let's talk about a few points here. What's changed? Number one, Jesus is a greater temple. Jesus is a greater temple. The temple is a foreshadowing of Jesus, okay? Uh, it was a place between heaven and earth where people could come and be connected to God the Father. And so Jesus is a greater temple. That's why, that's why Paul talks about there's one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is the greater temple. But we, go to, we go to a person now. And, and the temple had the Holy of Holies, right? And Jesus is the Holy of Holies. The temple was the very presence of God. And in Jesus, we have the presence of God. The temple is where you went to go and be close to God. And now we have Jesus. The temple is where you went and sacrificed an animal to atone for your sin, for your family's sin. And now we have Jesus, who was the ultimate sacrificial animal. And so at, at the time, the temple was the center of, of faith, it was the center of culture and worship. And so today, we don't need to go to the temple anymore because our faith is not in a place, it's in a person. You see, we don't believe in a holy land. Uh, that's a pagan idea. We believe in a holy God in the person of Jesus Christ. You, you see, a lot of people don't have this mindset. So what, what we have is each year, thousands and thousands and thousands of people make the trek out to Jerusalem and they go and visit the Wailing Wall. Maybe you guys have heard of it before. And the idea with the Wailing Wall is, is simply, it's this huge remnant that is still standing from Herod's temple. And so people will come from all over the place to visit this wall. And what they'll do, and you guys maybe will see it if you go to, uh, to Israel next year with Pastor Chris. But they have these pieces of paper where you can write down your prayers. And you roll up your prayer and you stick it into a crack in the wall. When you realize that this is why people come to visit this wall, it, it should break your heart. Because people think that because of this wall's association with the temple and the temple's association with being close to God, that this act of rolling up this prayer, sticking it into a crack in the wall, is the closest I can ever be to God. And it's, there's nothing mystical or magic about this wall. Um, it's tragic because now we realize if we want to pray to the Father, we just pray to the Son. And all these people who made this trek, who spent all this money to come visit this holy place, they could have just simply knelt down on their knees in their apartment and prayed to God directly. And so it's not about a place. It's about a person. And Jesus is that greater temple. Number two, what else has changed? Jesus is the greater high priest. He's the great high priest. And so back in that day, the high priest would be kind of the mediator between God and man. And he'd be the guy that would take care of all your pastoral duties. And so today, look, I'm not your priest, right? Pastor Chris isn't the high priest of Foothill Church. We don't, we don't think about that anyway, anymore. And because of that, because of what the Holy Spirit has now done in our lives, and according to what the Bible says, we now get to do what priests used to do. And so we can pray for each other. We can support one another. We can serve one another. We can uh, evangelize to our friends and neighbors and tell them about Jesus, our great high priest. This is what the book of Hebrews is, is all about. He talks about it over and over and over again, that Jesus is the great high priest. What else has changed? Number three, Jesus is the greater sacrifice. Jesus is the greater sacrifice. And so not only are we not going to the temple to worship. Uh, we're not offering any sacrifices anymore. And so we don't do that anymore. We're not slaughtering any, any animals because Jesus is the greater sacrifice. Um, they would take a lamb and shed the lamb's blood as the atonement for their sin. And, and as we know, Jesus, the lamb of God, the one who took away all the sins of the world, he came to earth and took care of that for us. So, do you see the big idea here? Um, 
we started with a fig tree, went to the temple, back to the fig tree. And, and the big idea here is it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. And as we see in this passage, Jesus will go to great lengths. He'll use his anger as an example. He used the temple and the fig tree as an example, all drawing people to himself, saying, guys, I, I want to know you. I want you to know me. And so as we wrap up here, I I'd like to give you just two things for application, okay? Uh, two things to take home with you. Uh, number one, and this maybe applies to me more than you, but don't miss the point. Uh, don't miss the point. As I said at the beginning, sometimes if we're not careful, if we just casually read scripture, um, like sometimes we do, we can walk through life thinking that, oh, I've read that already. I know what it's about. Uh, I, I know what I know, and, and that's it, right? And so we're, if we're casual about it, we might miss what God is trying to teach us. We might miss how God is, is teaching us something new. And so I just want to remind you, just don't miss the point. Who knows what he'll teach you today? Who, who knows how he'll teach you? If we're too caught up in, in our schedule and where we have to be and who we have to meet with, and we have no margin to spend any time with God, then we might have missed it. And so I encourage you guys to study your Bibles. Man, study your Bible. And so, some people say, you know, go to different churches or services and you hear all your life. Just, you know, just be in the Word. Just, just be in the Word. And I understand what they're saying when they say that. I encourage you, don't just be in the Word. Study your Bibles. Study it. Figure out what it says for you. Figure out what it says for your context. There is spiritual truth in here. And so if you just casually read it, you might miss it. Get in there and study it. Also, take the time to spend time with friends who aren't saved. Man, God might use you in a powerful way to just simply bring up who Jesus is in your life. And, and so take the time to allow God to speak to you during your prayer time. I know it's kind of a crazy idea, but instead of just saying, God, I need this, I need that, help me with this, spend some time in silence. And, and so again, don't miss the point. God might be teaching you something new. Uh, number two, a second application, lift your view of Jesus. Lift your view of Jesus. If we truly understand what Jesus claimed to be, who Jesus claimed to be in this Bible, and if we understand the effect of that claim on our life, on the life of the church, then we must lift our view of Jesus. Man, for thousands and thousands of years, religion, religion was built on this notion that in order to get to God, you had to jump through these hoops, do these things. You had to go to this temple. You had to make this sacrifice. You had to do all this stuff just to get close to God. And so we realized that because of the loving nature of God, because of his grace, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to atone for all of our sins. And so we don't have to do any of that stuff anymore. And so he is our temple. He is our great high priest. And he is our atonement for sin. He's the sacrifice. And so it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. He's the one we've been waiting for. Would you just uh, bow your heads and close your eyes just as we close this time out?